All right. Well, welcome everyone. I'm very excited to introduce Melissa Molina Trinidad, Senior Residency Program Coordinator for the General Surgery Residence at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. She currently holds a position of Chair of the Council of Program Administrators and Coordinators from the Association for Hospital Medical Education, a significant leadership organization within the GME community. Melissa is a dedicated and accomplished professional with a commitment to healthcare, medical education, diversity and, in and inclusion, as well as mentorship. Her leadership roles and involvement in various healthcare organizations highlight her expertise and contributions to the field. Thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon, Melissa. I will turn it over to you. Hello, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. It truly is an honor, and, and I look forward to showing you um, my expertise, and definitely we'll have time for Q&A because I love Q&A portions. Um, so the essentials of archiving tools for resident files and verification purposes. Um, I have been in the GME world for 10 plus years. I have gone through different departments and I have seen different processes. And to me, what I've seen has just been a chunk of paper and lack of organization. Because um, when a coordinator is in a role for a lot of years, they know where everything is. But what happens to like succession planning, um, you know, with, within growth, within, you know, bringing in a new coordinator or an emergency occurred or the pandemic occurred. So, you know, how can we all be successful in our roles and pivoting with, you know, um, data driven, you know, utilizing our, our, our um, technology to the best of our capabilities, which we have shown that we can uh, work remote, we can have a hybrid um programming, you know, scheduling with the PCs and the GME world. So it has like the pandemic had to happen, unfortunately, for this to occur or for it to be more of like, we need to rush to get there. I have no disclosures. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the surgical residency department in my institution. We have a family work culture, which I am so enamored with. We have dedicated employees. A perfect example of a dedicated employee is that a program coordinator um, that I took the role of served in her role for 50 years. Yes, it's 5-0. And the other coordinator uh, was there for 10 years. Uh, filing cabinets, which I'm sure a lot of us have. We had six large cabinets in two offices. We had four small single ones. Um, the suite did not have enough space. We had older files in an outside storage that I'm still trying to get access to. And verifications happen all throughout the year, random times. And um, they had multiple binders, but they weren't in order. So yes, we had verification documents, evidence that it was submitted, but there was no organization with it. And um, I'm not sure if your institution has this, but they have Cardex cards, um, which looks similar to, well, to that picture. So I know some people are like, what's a Cardex? Well, that's what a Cardex is. And that's something that old um, programs tend to have even GME offices as well. Now, that's a bit of a challenge, right? 50 years. <laughs> um, right now, the current state of the surgical um, department, we still have the family work culture. We have two new employees that were hired within the year, which was myself and another coordinator. Filing cabinets. Um, I didn't update this, but earlier this year, we had four large cabinets. Now we're down to three. Um, we have zero small single ones. And we reconfigured the suite to create extra office space. Um, and that's where another coordinator sits. So basically, it's like, how can you make room when, you know, everything is being clunked with filing cabinets and papers or documents or binders? Older files are still in storage. And one thing that we created was a general surgery uh, at Columbia email, which myself, the coordinator, the other coordinator and the clerkship coordinator have access to. So for example, on our website, we have this email in our website. Why? Because if, if someone's on vacation, if someone needs a verification, if someone, 
it's it's like, you know what? Let's all have access. One is the lead, but we all check in on that email. I'm not sure if your institution has it. I'm not sure if multiple people um, wear different hats, but that's one suggestion that I highly recommend to think about if, if everyone's in the same office. It's just more of like a coverage purpose and more of a streamline instead of having to forward emails upon emails. I'm not a fan. It gets lost in the mix. So um, just having a, a one place where everything is at kind of email, um, even like when there's inquiries, verifications, um, or just right now it's interview season, everyone's emailing us. So it's not, it doesn't get mixed between um, the other, if, if someone's out or not. So it was just good coverage purposes. Um, Adobe Professional, love it. Um, editing documents, you know, creating, um, extracting. It, I love Adobe Professional. It's my favorite thing. And another task was scanning verification documents to be organized. So I looked at the binder and a bunch of documents that were just hanging around on the table. And I just started scanning them one by one. And I would label them so that I would know, okay, this is a verification for so-and-so and -so the years. So when it comes for someone, that same person to get verified, I would know, okay, this is the actual information that I need to input. Work hard, work harder and smarter. <laughs> um, efficient and collaborative teamwork is what makes the dream work. So this is an example of what we have on the cloud. Um, you know, the ACLS, BLS of ATLS of the residents, APD documentation, APE, appointments, call room information, the CCCs, conferences, you name it, it's all in one shared drive. Who has access to this? The program coordinators, the program director, as well as the APDs. Do the APDs and PDs live here? No, they do not. This is where the PC has everything all in one place. So it's not like I'm working remote. I have it on my laptop or I have it on my computer and I can't access it. Nope, everything is on the OneDrive. And you know we, we make sure that everything is organized. If we need to tweak anything, um, we're sure to communicate, but all in all essence, we all know that, every, that everything is living in OneDrive and not on a computer. Why? Computers crash, computers have glitches. What is your backup? So for us, the OneDrive is our backup plan. Now, the question, what exactly are in resident files? Um, residency is intricate, has many different pieces, and every program or every, you know, specialty runs differently. So um, when I was getting ready to prepare for this, I contacted my GME office and HR, just so I was sure that I was providing you with the most accurate information. Human resource documents, the IRS application, the medical school diploma, personal demographics, appointments and reappointments, which we all know and love, <laughs> that happens every year, um, their CV, professional references, and their yearly clinical privileges delineation form. That's on the HR end. And I know that in some components, we get copies of those documents. So we definitely should keep them safeguarded in one place because we also reference this. Performance and specialty. Those certifications that I know is a drag for residents to do every two years and such. Um, ABS, metrics of the six core competencies, their letters of recommendation, research and scholarly activity, their semi-annuals um, and their um, annuals, final evals, copy of the residency diploma, FLS, FES, case logs, that's more for a general sur surgery, but just whatever um, certifications that the residents need to graduate, definitely put them in your uh, resident files. I'm sure you do, but now we're talking about digitally. Make sure that you keep a copy. Maximizing ongoing digital. Um, so this is an example of how I have gone digital when it comes to the verification process. Remember I said I was scanning documents of residents that were just unorganized. How can I be, be and stay organized? And I know that in our world, is a lot of last name comma first name, right? I feel like that's what makes everything so much easier and smoother. So for example, it'll be Doe comma James, 1970 was when they graduated. Um, and then on top of me having this um, PDF file, I have an Excel sheet, an Excel sheet that keep that tracks, you know, all the residents that were in my program. And like from start date, my residents go on research year. So I track that their end date, last name, first name, 
their email after they graduate, phone number, social security, date of birth, medical school, et cetera. It could be whatever you find um, that you need to be effective and quick when it comes to verification. But that's a setup that I have. So um, I'm continuously building on it because the life of a program coordinator never ends and we always throw in so much stuff. But this is something that I, I have a list of names. I just don't have their most updated information. Um, and I think once that is um, updated and clear, all you have to worry about is just the ones that graduate and where they go next. Um, and then the file will have a hyperlink on the Excel sheet. So the hyperlink would open up that PDF file that was scanned. This will reduce filing cabinets um, that you know, I know that in some specialties, um, I know that they had emphasized that they we were to keep, I know at one point it was like 10 years or seven years of physical document. Um, and now things have changed. Now it's saying, okay, you can have it digital. Before they were opposed to it. Now they seem a little bit more lenient because I think of what occurred during the pandemic. Um, and so number one to me, it's about reducing space and just working quicker and streamlined. Um, and then the retrieving storage files and digitizing them is just going to make it that much easier instead of having to travel somewhere or having to figure out where the filing cabinet is or having to ask somebody to get me that file because they're in an offsite. It's just something to just think about, to consider, to just make it easier for you and not harder. And the disclaimer I'm highlighting hit here, some files must be retained indefinitely and may very depend on the state. So please, like that's a disclaimer, make sure that you know what's going on in your state and in the GME office because we wanna abide that um, all the files that you need are where they're supposed to be and what you can get away with by working on this digital front. What documents should be kept? Future requests for primary resources. Um, the residents of final summative evaluation um, should be kept. I know I keep mine um, if they are physical. I know some program directors prefer a physical document and some are very much like, I don't need it, I'll, I'll just do digital. Um, my recommendation is whatever um, works for you in the long run. For example, my program director right now is everything's digital. So that's like, okay, good. I don't have to print anything. And I know that I'm just putting everything on the one drive. But there are some program directors that are like, no, I want a physical copy. And that's like, okay, you have to work with what you got. I would emphasize to scan it just in case. Um, but definitely it's whatever the program director wants. Or if you need to just say, hey, you know, I think we should go this route. Just touch, uh, like try the waters with your program director. Um, the letter of the PD indicating readiness for unsupervised practice, uh, periodic evaluations, medical school graduation documentations, and records of any educational or employment disciplinary actions. Um, I know that when these things do occur, I do keep a copy. I mean, I do keep the document on file because those kind of fall on the, you need to keep them indefinitely. But for those that, you know, are like in good standing, there's nothing, you know, alarming and such, you can just scan them and keep as is. So it, like I said, it all depends on how your program currently is running. The ACG verification template. So this is a reference of the Verification of Gradual Medical Education, AHA. Um, I am not sure if you are, are aware of this document, um, it's something that can be found online. And it's like a more of a generic like verification template that I know that ACGME is trying to emphasize that this be the streamlined process moving forward when it comes to verification. I've used it. It's I, I like it when it's straightforward and easy to complete. Um at times, uh when when ver when verifications come my way and it's like a story long of questions. I'm like, this is just way too much information for me to try to complete this as accurately as I, I can. But I do hope that ACGME and those verification um organizations go by this because this would also make our lives easier. Because what we would do is we would already had have inputted all the information of the graduates on this document. 
And when a verification question comes by, all we have to do is just forward them the document. It would make life so much easier. So the purpose, um, I say smart, um, streamlined process I live by, maximizing work in a hybrid setting, which is what all of us are trying to do, accurately have the correct information. We do not want no boo-boos, accidents, or I take that back, right? Uh, recreating an organizational flow, which is something that will be cohesive and just, you know, uh, bulletproof. And turnaround time, I, I've gotten feedback of how quickly I work. Um, I think it just comes with experience, it comes with comfort, and it comes with knowledge. But to me, I, I just want to give, you know, to me, it's kind of like checking off um, a, a checkbox Be when I do, okay, done. So that's like turnaround. My turnaround time sometimes seems to be a little bit impeccable. I hope a lot of coordinators feel the same way when they send, oh, boom, boom, boom. You receive the email. Oh, I got this done. I know it's a good feeling if you've experienced it. <laughs> and it also just shows that we're organized because when we're not is when we delay because we can't find what we're looking for. <laughs> Site visits. ACGME is the body responsible for accrediting all graduate medical training. Um, I don't know how many of you have had a site visits. Um, I recently had mine um, earlier this year and it was all digital. So um, even when GME was asking me for documents to review, um, those documents were um, physical. So I would go to the GME office visit with a physical document. And then funny enough, they scanned it all and they sent me the scanned document and was and they sent me the physical back. But it was like, oh, they just, that's what they needed. If I would have had a digital version, I wouldn't have had to travel to go see them. I would have just sent them what they wanted uh, virtually. Um, so the fact that ACGME has gone this route, it's kind of like, why can't the program um, do the same? Um, so the four disciplines of execution. Discipline one, estimate of one year to complete full project. That is my, um, I'm going to have to extend it because things have gone crazy. <laughs> um, but definitely, um, if this is something that you want to implement, give yourself a timeline and give yourself grace as well. Because we're trying to have, you know, complete the full job that we do, you know, our nine to five. And this is something extra. So if you can get any help or support or volunteers to scan documents, I highly recommend it. Discipline two, start with the most recent files. The most recent files, why? Because they're the ones that are gonna be the ones that you're gonna be pulling up and getting access to more frequently than the older ones. Discipline three, um, will, I will use the application Trello to monitor progress of this project. I have, but then I stopped <laughs> because a lot of changes happen, good changes happens in my program. Um, but it's something that if, if you use Trello or Motion or any other um, project management tool to keep you accountable or to just, you know, work better with, definitely recommend. And monthly commitment to assess and update the team is something that's very critical and crucial so that everybody knows where they are, where their bandwidth is, and what support is needed to accomplish um, the goal. And we made it to Q&A. Um, I know I threw a lot. I, I I hope that, you know, it was informative. I hope that, you know, you've, you've potentially have thought the same things I have or have maybe cre started creating um, that change or innovation in your um, residency program. So I'll open the floor. Thank you so much. I think my colleague and I are already in our minds thinking of all the uh, file cabinets we're going to get rid of very soon. <laughs> and and that and that is exciting to me. Um, I I like to like think like green, like lean green. Um, I don't like to waste paper if it's unnecessary. Um, and it's also cost effective if you really think about it. Um, looking at the. Looking at some of the things in chat here, people feel free to go ahead, Catherine. I see your hand raised. Question. So this is an issue that I ran into. So the person before me was in this position for a long time and she saved everything by year. 
not by resident. So we do have a folder for each resident with their like medical school diploma, just like the important things. Um, but in my mind, it makes more sense for everything to be in the resident file, not by year. So if someone says like, I need to see the summative evaluation of John Smith, I need to figure out when he graduated, then I have to go into that year folder and pull it up. Um, and so it just adds more steps. But the, our program's been around for a long time, so it would take me years to go through and change everything so that it was by resident. So I was just wondering if you've had that issue of like saving things by year because it's faster, and I understand that, but it also creates more steps when you have to retroactively go look for those those documents. Absolutely. So right now, um, my resident files are by year because they haven't graduated. So for example, like say PGY1, PGY2, PGY3, lab year 23 to 24, but that's temporary holds just mm -hmm. as like a quick of like you're looking at. But when they graduate, we put their name, like every every resident within that folder has a folder with their name on it, mm -hmm. like last name, first name because the folder is, our folder is digitized. So we have PGY1, we open that PGY1 folder and there it has the resident's last name, first name. So when they graduate, we put them in the graduates folder, but oh, we don't have to, and, and all we'll do was, is just add the year that they graduated at the end. So all graduates, you would see their name, last name first and then the year because when you when you're looking for a verification or when you're talking about somebody you're not asking them about let's look at 1984 it's very much like oh i'm looking for um doe smith okay how can i find doe smith if it's by year what year no <laughs> so definitely if i were you i would definitely just try to change each an individual by last name first name and their year um, I find it to be um, highly effective. And on top of that, when you're searching, it would just pop up. Yeah. Okay. I really like that idea of just doing it by year while they're in the program and then moving it to their permanent resident file. Thank you. That was very helpful. You're welcome. So how did you get your program director to transition to electronic uh, documents? Um, so honestly, it wasn't the program director that was reluctant. It was, um, think about it, when someone has been in their role for 50 years, they have a way of doing it. Um, from the feedback that I've received from the from people that have known the coordinator, she had like an, a, a great memory. So she didn't need to do all these extra steps because she's been there for 50 years. She knows them personally, because I told you we have a family work culture. And so for her, it was just like, okay, I know who it is. I know where it's at. I know I know this information. And my concern is always like, this is great, fabulous for you. But how can we be effective if, you know, turnaround time with an, a stranger? Uh, someone needs to step in. And um, what occurred was that um, when the pandemic happened, unfortunately, what she was doing was no longer effective. You know, um, she uh, the 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 APD stepped into the PC role because it was like it was technology, it was challenging, it was you know, and so thankfully the APD that stepped in to do the PC role created a lot of what I needed when I stepped in because. If not, I would have been completely lost in my own little island, not knowing what's going on. But she created um, Excel sheets and documents and digitalized folders with information. Um, and she was already tracking the residents and their um, BLS, ACLS, Adams. All of this was now digitized because everything before was paper. So it unfortunately, it, the pandemic had to happen for this switch to happen. So when I interviewed, I already had this mindset because everywhere I've gone, I've always been like, we need to get rid of paper. We're scanning. And that's the same thing that I did in my previous job. And verifications became easier um, when when I had to train somebody when I was leaving my 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 role. It was easier for me to transition them and the ball kept moving. 
instead of them trying to guess where things were or where the filing cabinet, where, you know what I'm saying? It to me is all about secession planning. And thankfully, um, when I interviewed at Columbia, they asked me like, do, am I comfortable with digitalization? I'm like, yes, that's what I do. And then they're like, oh, great, you're in. <laughs> because it's been 50 years. So it's like 50 years of me trying to catch us up to where we should be now. Yeah, that that's excellent. And as somebody who's been around a long time, I struggle with the, um, I feel like I'm giving up a part of history a little bit at, at the thought of digitizing something and potentially horrifyingly throwing something away, you know, but I also know exactly what you said, Melissa, during the pandemic, we all learned that we we couldn't turn around and dig through our files if we got a verification for someone. And it really, really forced me to have great digital copies of everything, especially for my current, current, current residents. And now I'm finding most everything I have for my current residents is digital opposed to on paper. Yeah, it's it's about just forward thinking. And I completely understand. Um, I, I found some sentimental um documents that I've scanned. I haven't parted with, but at the same time, it's not a filing cabinet long. Yeah. You know, like those key pieces, like those archivables, I would say, hey, they're gems, scan them as well. But, you know, they're gems. Um, but when it comes to like a magnitude of filing cabinets, which I have seen, it's it's not necessary. You could be utilizing your space much better and your time. Did you have an assistant to help you digitize your files? No. You did everything yourself. Yes. So um, I haven't completely, completely done it. Like, for example, the exams I've scanned because my residents asked for their their copy of report because before it used to be physically given to them. I'm like, I'm not giving you a physical copy. I'm giving you a digital one. <laughs> um, so, you know, scanning those. Um, we use MedHub mm -hmm. and uploading those things on MedHub. So it's like, to me, I'm very much more like, I, I'm here to help you, but I don't want you to depend on me. I want to give you access. I want to give you the resources that you need. So when time comes, you know, you have that information. You don't have to rely on me or wait for me to give you something that you should have already. <laughs> um, so that's something that I've worked on is making sure the MedHub is updated, that their documents are there um, as a point of reference. Um, and, 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 teaching them that because they didn't know and it's like it's there here you go here you find it you know and then it's like now they're aware of like where to go and get it instead of saying oh um melissa um i need this you know so i'm like no you have it <laughs> go ahead susan hello thanks denise hi melissa thanks so much for your time I actually was just going to comment on that question as well. Um, several universities, you're a four-year university and you have federal funding. Uh, they're required to have storage uh, and they can help transition from your paper to your electronic. They have services. Sometimes they're free, depending on your school. Sometimes they charge you out of your budget, but every uh, ACGME, GME budget has what's called a facilities maintenance and you can actually charge that scanning and um, facilities maintenance, which was something I found that was awesome. Um, and I'm also going to echo what Melissa said about find out the retention laws, because again, we're federally financed. We're actually moving offices. And I'm, I had, again, my predecessor, 38 years in their service, just like you, Melissa. Uh, and my predecessor kept a lot of things, but you also cannot just randomly delete things because of federal funding, you have to get permission and then you have to send it to the right person and you can get hugely fined if you don't do that. So she, Melissa wasn't kidding when she says, check with them and see that. But um, yeah, they have a lot of permanent storage and rules. The one thing that scared me too, Denise, I was with you, having someone else do it and not do, seeing what happens, I found out also you are not allowed to retain the paper copies after, after you've digitized them, at least in my state. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, they're like, you. here's your retention rules. If you scan it, you retain this for 40 years, depending on what it is. And then you have to fill out the form and have the other files deleted. So 
if you use them to scan for you, be careful because they're probably going to ask you to keep the other ones and destroy it. But thanks again, guys. That was awesome. Yeah, and I think Catherine raises a good question, too. If you find stuff like old patient-related information in there, what do you do? Do you just do you just destroy it? Do you keep a copy of it? I don't know. That's a good question. I've never seen patient information in any of my resident files. That's very weird because patient information should never be in a resident's file. The resident's file has to do with the resident's training. So yeah. that would be a mistake um, that may have been um, maybe something that the resident submitted by accident because that definitely should not be there. Yeah, so usually they're case studies that they put together for didactic purposes. So it'll be a PowerPoint, like we had this patient come in, this is their name, this is oh. all of their PHI. Um, so I think that's how it originally got saved there because it was a part of just their didactic outcomes and productivity. Uh, but I think HIPAA was passed in the 90s. And so I guess pre-90s, they just really didn't care about having all of this information out there. And so every now and then I just find it. Um, I feel comfortable deleting it because it's not like formal hospital records or anything. Yeah. But um, it does I, make me kind of nervous. I, I agree with you 1000% because you do not want it to accidentally for it to fall in the wrong hands. Um, I know that when residents present, they present, but whatever information I need to have for like their scholarly activity or any documentation, that information is not like in their file. Um, so yeah, so that's a, a good key component to have. Yeah. Yeah. If because, you get patient information that's inadvertently in there, you can just check with your medical records department. That's I've done that in the past, just, you know, checked with them and forwarded it to them and let them, you know, disseminate it to whatever clinic file they feel appropriate. Not to change direction too much, but I think it will be of great interest to the people who are on this call because we have, we have talked about this amongst ourselves very, very, very often. Um, so you said you had a recent ACGME site visit and that everything was digitized. And of course, the last site visit I had was many years ago and it was not digitized at all. So basically, did you, everything that they wanted, you just like emailed to them, to the site visitor? Yes. Yeah. Yes, um, they have their they have the um, the questionnaire. They have you know what files they they wanted to look at, and then mm -hmm. I basically those files were already digitized. So I just had to just copy and you know put them in a folder yeah. and just zip it and send it. Did they come in person or they no. did it like virtually entirely? Virtual. virtual. I have a question. <clears throat> As you can see in my background, I still have binders. And I know. I saw you earlier. And I'm I mean, like, those oh, are old. yeah, they're very old. And um, I do all my digital now and I have been for years. I don't have, I just haven't had time to get to those binders and scan them all in, but I'm working on it. Because <laughs> um, I have been in this job for going on 30 years. So, yes, I have a lot of binders and old information when we did were not digitized so of course um now for my old like the um ones that have graduated and has been graduated for a long time <clears throat> how far back do we have do we keep those indefinitely um i know that cardex I know wise answer. i know that cardex wise i have their <laughs> information um and i don't know um how like how much you have in your um in your location but my old 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 files are in a storage that i still have trouble gaining access to but my goal ultimately was to get those files scanned so that i can have access all in one digital format um for well, me, I have like one file cabinet full of them. <laughs> my my recommendation is, I we we want to talk about archiving. We want to talk about history. We want to talk about keeping things. I would much rather keep it digitized. 
anything that you have already in paper, just scan it, digitize, archive it um, on a digital front and discard the paper because it's no longer relevant. And then what about, I guess my main question is, all these binders behind me are old conference sign-in sheets. And when I say old, I mean old. Like some of them may be before my time. Well, most of them were before I even took the job. But I just don't get rid of them because I don't know what to do with them. Or how far back do we have to keep sign-in sheets from conferencing? Honestly, I will say that if you have not opened a binder, you don't need it. Well, some of those resident, good. some of those residents might be retired, Kim. <laughs> yeah, and 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 to me, and to me, my I mean, thing is, I just, I feel if like one has, I don't need them, but I, then again, I don't if, want to break any rules. <laughs> no, no, no. You, what I, I honestly, I don't think that like 20, 30, 40 years ago, people are going to want to see who attended a conference. Well, it doesn't go that far, but I mean, but I but I mean, hypothetically, ten years worth. Ten, nice. Even then, uh, hold on. Ten, I honestly, from from, if I were you, my recommendation would be like speak to your program director, or speak to your GME office, or even speak, look into your ACGME guidelines, um, or, and have those conversations. In my opinion, my conferences are all digital. Well, I mean. We just put sign-in sheets out. I mean, we keep it simple here. We just, we they sign in, I scan them in, and they go in a file. They're all digitalized. I oh, mean, okay. That's just if, how we do it. And if, it's not a big deal for me to put the sign-in sheets out for them to actually sign in on. It's not a big deal at all. No, that's great. But um, what I'm saying is... Um, I mean, it works for us. I just didn't know, you know, if, just how... I, I I honestly say if it's already been like digitized, you do not need a physical. Okay, that I was yeah, my next question. Like I do scan them all in, but can I just shred the hard drive? I mean the hard copy. Yes, and and the beauty behind that is if anyone needs a a, a physical one, which rarely do they anymore. Yeah, you can print it out and say, "Here you go." And do we even have to have the sign-in sheets anymore? Can we just say they attended the conference and put a check off, a check mark on an Excel sheet now or something? Or do they want to see actual signatures on a sign-in sheet? I know that um, in my in my um, division, we use, a lot of people are using QR codes. A lot of people are using checkbox. Mm -hmm. um, we have that. Yeah, so you there's your answer. Um, I mean, we have a QR code, but we don't use it. We use it for more so CME because they can get CME for some of the conferences. Yes, um, in my that division is also CME, but it doesn't link to them actually signing in for a conference. Yeah, but we were the ones who fill out the attendance of who attended for their CME, correct? No, I don't. It just oh. automatically goes to the CME office. They handle all that. So then, I guess talk to your CME office and say, do you need a do you need a signature or can a check off be enough? Yeah, that's great advice. Okay, yeah. I just didn't know how other people do it. Yeah, for, for, for my division, it's QR code, and then um, we complete the CME, and we put the attendance of who attended that lecture, and that's it. Mm -hmm. A signature isn't needed. It's just more of us attesting that these individuals went. Okay, because last time we got dinged on that, when we had a site visit, because we didn't have... They wanted everybody signing in and they wanted it separated from the residents on one sign-in sheet and the faculty on the other one. So that's why I did that. But that was also a long time ago. I haven't had a site visit in over 10 years. So How long ago was it? <laughs> it's been over 10 years. I think we were supposed to have one in 2018. It gets post it keeps getting postponed. What what I will emphasize um as another, I mean, how can I say it? Um we've had like didactics and conferences go virtual, like Zoom sessions. That attendance sheet is more of like, oh, okay, these are the people who attended that can be as a reference to checking off those boxes. What happened 10 years ago in the GME world right now is completely different. 
-hmm. If I were you, I will double check with them because I don't want you to be doing work that was valid 10 years ago that is no longer valid now. Yeah, I just, I assume that they still needed signatures of people attending the conference as proof that you attend the didactic. So well, Miss Kim, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I went through this too, coming on you because we were doing sign in sheets and they were so unreliable and you can't track them. Um, talking to ACGME at the last conference in Nashville, mm -hmm. you can track it any way you want, but you must track it. There are required didactic hours. This conference is being one of those protected conference hours that must be tracked and retained and be able to be validated for each of the residents. How many hours did they participate? So however you track it is great. Like Melissa said, the QR codes, I went to that. Oh my God, it's, I've got a 90 to hundred percent accountability versus 65 when I came on from the signatures. But yes, you do have to track it and you do have to retain it for every resident because it is a didactic required hours for ACGME programming. So yeah, it's, it's a pain, but if you can, like she says, Melissa, streamline it, make it easier. I do it through new innovations, use a QR code. I assign it to my chief residents. You can even do a QR code just for the room. So you don't even have to create one every week. Mm -hmm. Just put it up in that room with your chief residents and attach it to your conference schedule and your software. And it, then you have a whole report. You print it out, attach it, send it to ACGME for your site visit. Here's all my hours. Yeah, the problem is we don't use MedHub and those things. We don't have that here in my institution. So we don't have the ability to do that. Yeah, you can create QR codes. Um, there's several I mean, I programs. QR, yeah, we have a QR code for urology. Mm -hmm. um, that That's connected to their CME. Right, so there's a lot of programs out there. You can create a QR code and a tracking and a tickler for even just Microsoft Access and start tracking your, your conferences that way. So you don't have to do all that paperwork and sign and everything, but I'll be quiet now. I just wanted to throw my two cents in there. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. That was all I had. Did you have a question, Kanoa? Sorry, no, I was just gonna add suggestions about the QR code and like what we do, but I think it's all been covered. So I'm good, thank you. All right, and I see, Susan, you had put some information here about um, residents or fellows who don't complete the program. I would, having kind of gone through something similar to this, uh, my suggestion would be to always check with your legal department in your institution before getting rid of anything to do with somebody who had some kind of either remediation or um, did not finish the program kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thousand um, percent. I have that happened to me as well. I kept those files, and I also have them scanned um, because um, lawyers were involved. So mm -hmm. they wanted that GME wanted a copy. The lawyers wanted a copy. So I I scanned the whole file. I have it digitized, but I also have that one. That's one of those those files that are to be kept like indefinitely for yeah. confidentiality purposes. Yeah, I pulled that quote, Denise, right off the ACGME website. So that you guys have the ACGME requirements, your local GME requirements, your local legal requirements, your department requirements. And so like Melissa and Denise say, check with everybody before you delete anything. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. CYA, baby. Yes. And I think what you said, Melissa, about having like a spreadsheet that includes all of your resident files is great because, you know, 20 years from now, when there may be a new chairman, a new education team, and somebody says, oh, I, I have a historical question about, you know, what occurred here in the 80s or whatever, they have that information because, you know, mm -hmm. the woman who wasn't there for 50 years is of course gone now. And so there's just kind of that history stuff that you've made available to them as well. Yes. And what I'm also adding on to that is um their gender, their ethnicity, and where they ended up going. Oh, great. That's in addition, because I do want to pull that data. 
yeah. and say, you know, from our program, we've had X amount, you know, men, X amount women, you know, and this, you know, the predominant, you know, fellowship or specialty that they chose to go is this one, you know, to put up like just to see the growth, to see, you know, the accomplishment of our graduates and such. So I just think that um, honing in on that for the next 50 years, you know, the 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 next couple of coordinators will be able to hopefully continue on that tradition and pull that data out. Yeah. Our GME office wants us to track our alumni and where they go, whether it's, you know, private practice or they go to another academic institution. They want that data now. It's also um when we fill out the the GME track AMC, mm -hmm. like they ask us these questions. So it's kind of like, okay, we, we have these answers. It's more like, okay, having it all compiled. That's what I love about MedHub. Um, having come from prior to MedHub, a program where we did everything on paper. I, I love the fact that MedHub is kind of my hub essentially for storing it. And our GME office actually has a policy um, regarding what we are required to store in MedHub, which I think is great because it everything is there at our fingertips should we need it, but it's also there at their fingertips should um, you know the joint commission come and ask for records or whatever, and it's easy for them to find. Um, so that kind of, I think, goes hand in hand with the digitizing. You know, we just upload, like you said, the summative evaluation to MedHub, and we know we will always be able to find it there for our alumni. Yes. So recently, um, my GME office created um, the um, semi-annual and the summative eval folders in MedHub so yep. that they we have to upload them and the ILPs. Yeah. Um, something that they didn't have access before unless we had to send it to them or unless they asked. So that step forward is great. And they created, you know, the, the template that they wanted us to use to streamline that, that process. And then the program coordinators um, put in that information. And then, you know, the PD usually digitally, I mean, virtually will meet with the resident or they would get a physical copy and then we'll scan it. And then the resident has it, the PD, the APDs have access to it, the GME office. So everybody that needs it, it has access to what they need. Any other questions? I have one more. The MedHub, is that institutionally used or by program? It's institutionally used by program, like instit like GM like um MedHub is institutionally based, right? Because institution pays for it, and it's given to all the programs to use. Okay, they haven't done that with us yet. <laughs> I wish they would. I'm surprised because usually we like the one forty five. I'm sorry. We have one forty five, which stores all the evaluations and milestones. Well, the milestones are stored in the on the ACGME. With, along with their case logs and stuff. Mm. Um, but all the other evaluations are done and sent out through 145. So that's what we use. Oh, wow. I've never heard of 145. That's been around for a long time. Wow, I'm gonna I'm gonna Google that after our, our meet yeah. after our call today. <laughs> yeah, 145, yeah, because... it's where you um keep up with all the medical students and residents. Um, they do their duty hours in there and um, all their evaluations are done through there. Okay. Yeah, no, all I know is, is of um, eValue before, then became MedHub, and then new innovations. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, any more questions? Because uh -oh. this is my, my closing. <laughs> What can I what can I declutter at work my space to find more ease simplicity to be successful in my role? Um, I that's like my my takeaway for for you all to just think about you know um, when it comes to going into work whether it's hybrid or full on campus or fully remote, um, when things are disheveled or unorganized, we're spending more of our energy and time just trying to get or find the information that we need. And once we 
put those pieces together and organize and streamline and innovatively work it in our favor, that's when we're going to feel fully accomplished and feel fully successful. And everyone from the outside looking in is going to say, wow, you know, that PC or that PA knows their stuff or, and knows where everything is and knows, you know, is a master in, 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 in their role, in their job and look what they've managed to change or, you know, innovate and, you know, how, how to be just a, a better, um, I guess, fulfill, f- fulfillment in your role is, is my all, like my, my takeaway and my advice to you all. I hope that um, with my presentation, you a light bulb maybe came on, or maybe you've been hesitant or don't know how um, to go take that next step. I hope that you feel, you know, reinvigorated and supported that this is something that a lot of us are, you know, have a challenge that are working on it or have almost finished. But um, I think that as as program coordinators, we're all in the same situation. Um, and it's just all about how can we just work work smarter. I agree. Thank you so, so much, Melissa. That was wonderful. Yes, and if, if anyone is interested in connecting with me, I am on LinkedIn and this is my email. Um, I've had questions in the past for my presentation or anything you would like. I, I'm very, very much invested in the graduate medical education world and you know we're, we're in it together. So I thank you so much for the invitation. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. It was great to see everyone today. Have a great recruitment season. Talk to y'all soon. Bye.